Today I'm delighted to be joined by a writer, director, actor and activist who has recently graced her screens in The Danish Girl and new release Colette. He's a man of many talents. Please welcome Jake Graff, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, before we get started, Hello. welcome to Hiya. Um, if you guys have any questions for Jake, we would love to hear from you. You can tweet us at Build Series LDN or leave a comment below this video if you're watching live on Facebook. Welcome to Build. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thanks so much for having me. So we've got lots to talk about. But let's, let's start with um, Colette, which is out now on DVD and uh, Blu-ray. So just for those, well, people who wouldn't know much about it yet, but just tell us what it's about. So Colette is the story of the most uh, famous and prolific female author in France who lived kind of around the, the beginning of the 19th, uh, 20th century, 1900s. Um, and she is like a massive heroine in France. I'm half French, so I grew up reading all her work. And it was like, you know, Colette was like the, 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 the author to read. And uh, this is the story of uh, the early years of her life and how she, well, I won't ruin the story for you, but, but loosely how her work is kind of taken by her husband and what she goes through to kind of reclaim her work and, and her name to be actually, you know, attributed to, to the work that she's written, which, you know, she was locked in rooms to do and so on and so forth by this quite boorish husband. Um, and you are starring alongside some big names. You've got Kira Knightley and Dominic West and your character, Gaston. Yeah. Um, tell us how your character fits into the, the whole storyline. So my character, basically, uh, Kira Collette, has a crush on my wife. And uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of a guy that hangs out in the local salon, and uh, it's you know it was kind of the time of uh, Moulin Rouge where everyone used to go out. And it was all sort of very debauched and bohemian, and uh, I introduce Colette to my wife, and then Colette and my wife have a bit of a flirtation. Mm. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and I think it, it, I think it was Kira's first woman-on-woman -woman scene, which was really? really? yeah, with, with Denise Goff, who is equally amazing, and who I spent a lot of time talking to about what it was to be trans, because obviously Denise Goff's character, uh, Missy, or Uncle Max, was an early trans man, and so we spent a lot of time talking, and Denise is amazing, and their scenes are super steamy. Ooh, well, we look forward to that. Um, so how did you look up involved in the, um, in, in, in the film? Uh, it, it was weird in Colette because um, Walsh Westmoreland, the amazing director who also directed Still Alice with Julianne Moore, um, he had seen me doing The Danish Girl and kind of we had friends in common from The Danish Girl and uh, he wanted to give opportunities to trans actors and so he strangely got in touch via Facebook and was like, you know, I've been following your work and I'm doing this film and I'd love to have you in and this is like an Oscar winning director kind of messaging you on Facebook which is really weird and, uh, and then the casting agent called me in and I went and met this really nice guy and I hadn't really thought, I didn't really know who Wash was and so I walked into this audition and it was at the casting agent's house so it was all kind of low-key anyway and there's this really nice guy sitting on the sofa and he said you know read it for me once and read it for me twice and he went great love it and uh, and then after, after when you're sitting there I said you know would I have seen anything you've done and he was like well you know I made a little film called Still Alice you may have seen it and I was like oh my god right. what an idiot um, <laughs> although it did mean I was a lot more laid back about the audition so in future always always make sure you know who you're meeting yeah 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 um, do people ask you what it's like to play a cisgender character they do, which always feels weird to me. It's like in America, they're like, so, so you're playing like a cisgender guy. I'm like, that's awesome. How does that feel? And I, I obviously answer every time I, it feels normal because yeah. it's playing a man and I'm a man. And if anything, it was playing the role of a woman for the last sort of 28 years of my life that felt weird. So playing a guy feels like the most natural thing in the world. So not all that weird at all. Um, and you also starred in The Danish Girl. Um, which is a slight departure from the kind of more contemporary stuff that you do yourself. What is it that, that you like about the period roles so much? What draws you to them? I mean, I think what draws me to them is being called into the casting room and, <laughs> and being offered a part. Um, I think it's really amazing that we've got to a place in the last kind of five or six years where a trans or queer themed period piece would be made at all. Because I, I think, honestly, about 10 years ago, if someone had gone into a studio and pitched to a, to a big studio, a, a £15 million transgender queer period piece, people would have laughed them out of the room. 
and there's really been this kind of change and this opening yeah. and this opening of minds and you know I, I think real desire for, for fresh content and you know obviously yes it is it's, it's a period piece but you're learning about people that have been around since the dawn of time queer and LGBTQ identified people and mm -hmm. it's great because you're seeing that we were and have been around since you know for what for millennia since since you've all been around since we've all been around because you know we are just one of the many diverse faces of uh, humanity. Um, let's talk LGBTQI um, stuff because you are so involved in that, aren't you? Um, what are you doing for um, LGBTQ Pride Month? Well, my wife and I. Lots of stuff, I imagine. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's been busy. It's. It's. Uh, we're really lucky because obviously we have been doing lots of campaigns and shoots for River Island and various other um, company, you know, organisations and so on. We're doing a shoot for Pride in London on Thursday. And uh, we're actually going out to New York next week for a bit of the Pride celebrations over there. But for Pride in London on the day, I think we're marching with four groups this year. We're marching with Mermaids because we're patrons of Mermaids. Um, and they're a charity that works with transgender kids and their families. Uh, marching with Albert Kennedy Trust, which um, works with LGBT homeless youth. And we are marching with Diva Magazine, which is I, a, a, the biggest lesbian and bisexual woman magazine in the UK. So we're marching with them. And uh, marching, a lot of marching. Marching, right there, right? Yeah. I, I mean, marching is just walking quickly, so it's just running up and down, running up and down, <laughs> running, <laughs> running to float, flow, flow, changing your t-shirt, you, you know, blowing a whistle, and and then we're doing lots of brunches. We've been invited to about five brunches, which is great because you stuff yourself before you go, and uh, and then we're hosting the Trafalgar Square stage and hosting the women's stage for a little bit. So it's going to be a busy day. Hopefully, it won't rain. Wowzers. Um, and so you, you know, you've done a lot of um, stuff internationally, haven't you, in terms of um, all the advocacy that you that you do. And you were on a panel at the White House back in 2015 on the first um, transgender-led panel ever. Yeah, I mean... What was that like? It, it, obviously, it was amazing. It was, it was off the back of the Danish girl, and uh, this was obviously when Obama was in office, not to our friend Mr. Trump, because I don't think it would have happened, not with the same welcome anyway. Um, and uh, the guys behind the Danish girl had spoken to the guys behind Transparent, and so it was the first ever Trans-Pacific event at the White House with all the cast and writers and producers of Transparent, and Alicia Vikander, and Tom Hooper, and Rebecca Root, and it was an amazing day at the White House, and they screened the film, and they did lots of panels with various people from within the community, and uh, I mean, it was incredible. We were toured around the White House afterwards, um, That's pretty it, special. Yeah, I mean, it, it genuinely, we, we were all walking through these rooms as queer people in, in this, you know, opulence like you've never seen, just kind of going, how have we got here? How How is this happening? It was, you know, I think we all grew up believing that we'd never really amount to anything and, and you know, not really know who we were or where we would fit in society. And to find ourselves in the house, you know, the big white house, it was yeah. really, really mind-blowingly amazing. Should we tell them what you tell me backstage, though? I don't know, what are you about to say? You what didn't get to, they were there for four hours, <laughs> didn't get a tea or a coffee offered to them. And it was freezing cold, it was so cold that all the ladies in their little dresses were like, you know, asking us for a jacket. So we had to do the gentlemanly thing, give us our blazers, which meant all the guys sat there freezing for four hours with not a tea or coffee or sandwich in sight, which I think was a bit poor. That wouldn't have happened if a garden was there, let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, it wouldn't have happened in, in Theresa May's house. No, certainly not. <laughs> we got the scones as well down Theresa's gaff. Um, so listen, we, we speak, <laughs> you speak out a lot about you know, um, uh, TV and film. So where do you stand on the casting debate? Do you think that gay men, are, that gay characters, or trans characters should be played by trans people? Um, do you, like for instance, the Danish girl, we have like a cis lead um, playing a, a trans character. Where do you stand on all that? I think for many, many years we have been desperate and crying out to see our stories on the big screen. And, you know, obviously Eddie doing that role five years ago was really, really groundbreaking anyway. Um, the film would not have had the reach that it did had it not been a big name like Eddie. You know, he just won the Oscar. Everyone wanted to see more Eddie Redmayne. And, you know, aside from the fact that he's a really, really sweet guy and he genuinely is absolutely charming, but aside from all that, you know, when, when I went over to the US after that, I had friends of mine say that 
their mothers and fathers who hadn't spoken to them for five or ten years since they come out had recently been to see Eddie Redmayne and the Danish yeah. girl. You know, it's a Sunday afternoon in Michigan or Missouri, or and you know, let's go and see Eddie Redmayne. You ask a winner, honey, and they walk in, and obviously they get Eddie full frontal and think, Christ, what are we watching here? <laughs> but hopefully learn a little bit about the trans experience, and then a lot of them then went home and actually made radio contact with their kids. They're estranged children for the first time in five or ten years, and picked up the phone and said, you know, I, I kind of understand a little bit more about what you're going through now. And if a face like Eddie and a name like Eddie, <clears throat> cis or, or queer or straight or whatever, can do that, then surely that is the point of film. It's to kind of open hearts and open minds. And obviously, you know, now we've moved on five years. Yes, there are more trans actors and more visibility, and, and hopefully those trans actors will start getting seen for those big roles. But you've got to bear in mind that it is a business, it is an industry, sure. and it is about getting bums on seats, because if the films aren't, aren't you know, making money, then they just won't make more of those films. Do, when you say so, do, there, a lot of work is and has been done, but do you think there's a lot more um, to go? Yeah, I mean, as with, as with anything, as with anything, sort of LGBTQ, any kind of marginalised group or civil rights movement, there's always a long way to go. Um, I think there's been a lot of progress, certainly with um, films with BAME um, uh, individuals, you know, like Moonlight a couple of years ago that won the Oscar, which was incredible. There's been a big shift in um, Hollywood because they realise they have to be more diverse. They yeah. can't keep on making it all white, these big whitewashes. And by the same token, yes, it is important that gay actors are getting seen for gay roles and that trans actors are getting seen for trans roles. But by the same token, I wouldn't only want to be able to play cisgender roles because obviously that's very limiting. And I think, you know, the joy of being an actor is to be able to spread your wings and play, play those role. parts. Yeah, I mean, for me, again, you know, when I'm casting a, a trans role, I would never not cast a trans actor, but then I'm not working with budgets of £15 million sure. pounds yet. Um, and so for me, I'm really lucky that I have a huge pool of, of friends and talent that I can call upon any time and get those people for the role. But again, I don't have a studio breathing down my neck to, to make sure that theatres are filled for, for yeah. weeks on end. So um, so you mentioned your, your partner, Hannah. You guys have been described oh, as a transgender power couple. Um, do you embrace that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Hannah actually is about to get an MBE tomorrow, so tomorrow morning we're off to Buckingham Palace. That's a round of applause. She is, she is the highest ranking transgender officer in the British Army, and she worked as their transgender champion for five years and changed a lot of policy, not only for trans people, LGBT people, you know, uh, non-binary people, and she has just done incredible work, so I'm incredibly proud of her. And yes, it is amazing, obviously, to be called any kind of a power couple and you know obviously there's not a huge amount of competition it's not like there's loads, loads of there. about three couples in the media but yes it is lovely and it is really great to be able to do things like this and you know to be able to give visibility for the sure. younger generation growing up you know Hannah and I when we were growing up had no visible role models and had no one to look up to and had no one to give us that hope that we could make something of ourselves or become anything or live happy lives or find love and when you're a kid you know I grew up in 80s London feeling like completely hopeless and like I yeah. never live a normal whatever normal is a normal life and Hannah felt the same and, and we both feel incredibly lucky to have found each other and to have a voice and hopefully leave a legacy of some sort of positive change I guess well keep doing what you're doing and we can't wait to see what you guys get up to um, in the next couple of years let's just talk a bit about your own projects because you've got a, a lot of different things in the pipeline don't you you're writing a feature film what can you tell us about that yeah so my first feature film I've made eight shorts nine shorts eight shorts and uh, now is the time, having funded all those to the tune of God, about probably about £45,000, now is the time to stop using, you know, stop it being a hobby and kind of make it, you know, make something that people will hopefully go and see on a broader scale. And so I've written a, um, I'm on fourth draft of my feature film, which amazingly is being produced by the producers behind the McQueen documentary. So they're which double BAFTA nominated, exactly, double BAFTA nominated, and uh, one of the team is also transgender, so we're kind of like a, a trans power team going out to, to, to pitch at the moment and it's basically the story of a, a, a gay man in a relationship with another man obviously and um, he gets pregnant so it's revealed that he's trans and it's basically his own journey to accept not only himself and his changing role within society but also the child growing in within him <clears throat> and whether or not he can you know carry on being carry on feeling like a man it's all there's I mean there's a lot going on it's all about identity really identity and choices and and how society puts their pressures on you and whether or not you can just be happy whilst disregarding society sounds fascinating um how what's the writing process like for you and where does the, the where does that where does the creative flair come from and where and where and how do you write 
I lock myself away at home for hours on end, um, and I try and write for six hours a day, seven wow. hours a day. I mean, you've kind of, I think, got to, because there are so many distractions. That one of my worst things is the mobile phone that sits on the desk, and eventually I have to put it in a drawer, and then it's still beeping, and I find it really hard to switch off. But otherwise, it's just, I grew up, um, when I was kind of six or seven years old, because life was quite tough, and I knew that I was a boy from the age of about three, and obviously society didn't didn't believe that, and my mum and dad didn't believe that, and nobody believed that, and so I began writing stories. You know, I'd write long, long stories for hours where I was a little boy, where I was a boy, or where I was a man, and where I could be a superhero, where I could be whatever I want, and it was always the, the you know, I was always a boy, and these were my way, <clears throat> excuse me, those were my way of kind of coping with quite a tough childhood where I didn't really feel like I could talk to anyone about who I was. And I guess from that early age, starting to write from that early age and tell stories has luckily carried on to, into later life. So, you know, it's, it's something that I've done from the earliest age. And I would strongly encourage you to pick up a pen and start writing. If, if there's anything in you, everyone goes, you know, there's one book in everyone. Write your book, write your film, tell it's your story. So, it's easier said than done, though, <laughs> to just try and get all of that down on paper and actually create something that's you know, quite comprehensive. So you might, nice. you might surprise yourself. Yeah, well, I try it. <laughs> um, so is it, is it nice for you to kind of be in control of, of all of that, to be writing it, to be uh, directing it, to be acting those parts in, in, in some of your movies? Yeah, I mean, I'm incredibly lucky because I, as I said, I've self-funded everything. So it's been a question of, I wanted to tell a story, I've told the story, I've then found a producer, we've made the film. Obviously, I get, you know, as the writer, director, and the funder, I kind of get all the decisions and I can make my all the choices. I get final say, I have full autonomy, which obviously is not how it works. As soon as you start going up a level and, and you, people are giving you money, then you lose that autonomy completely and you're just the director. And then it all comes down to the executive producers and the producers. So at the moment, I'm kind of relishing. I'm probably going to make one more short film before hopefully shooting the feature next summer and giving away all my power. Um, before we wrap, I just want to ask you, what message would you like your followers to take from the kind of work that you create? I just would really love for there to be more acceptance, I think, particularly within our little, or our very big LGBT community, there's been lots of infighting, lots of disagreements, lots of fighting for visibility. I think, you know, we all just really need to get along and realise that we are all people and that there is, I think, you know, as you leave the world, you really want to be remembered for hate and for bigotry and for prejudice. I think you'd much rather, as you lie on your deathbed, be remembered for being accepting and tolerant and loving and giving. And I think if everyone remembered that over the course of their life, as opposed to in their last few minutes, then the world would be a much better place. What a lovely <coughs> note to wrap on. Thank you so much for joining us on Build. Thanks so much. Collect. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Collect is out on DVD and Blu-ray now and head over to Jake's website for more details on all the great things that he's up to. We're back with the Kaiser Chiefs, Ricky Wilson tomorrow, so do join us then. But right now, please give it up one more time for Jake Graff. Oh yeah, of course you are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's better. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. That button is very, very...